Okay, very quick introduction of what we're going to do in this video. Obviously, we will learn how to just render this coffee maker. The file is supplied, so you can download it from the link. In this video, we will actually rebuild three environments, a white, then this colored gradient backdrop and a black uh, reflective and blurry backdrop. In addition, we will, by studying these reference images, try to figure out how can we set up all the individual lights to recreate the reflections on it. Then we will take a look at and learn how we can make nice looking uh, metal, including the environmental reflections and reflection boards. And for the plastic in this exercise, we will look into how can we create a material that is um, quite, how could I say that, quite bumpy, but not 100% sandblasted bumpy, more actually having kind of like a plateau look. And I will introduce you to how to use the noise texture together with the gradient and um, other interesting tricks. Very good. Um, yeah, that's kind of all. So let's get going. Before we get started in Blender, let's take a look at the desired outcome. Here are three renderings I did. They look pretty nice. Well, obviously, I did it. So um, what can we learn actually from these three images? If we compare them, we can see one is on the white. That's uh, and a diffuse background, then a gradient background with a nice reflection that's also clean, and then on a black um, background with a blurry subtle reflection. When we take a look at the coffee maker, we can also see that the coffee maker is slightly rotated. Um, that makes everything look less static, a little bit more dynamic. And where it really is interesting is when we pay attention to how the handle actually feels in each rendering. The lighting is actually the same for each rendering. But by changing the environment and the backdrop, you can see how different everything works. Pay attention to the handle on the black backdrop. Here, this reflection of a light source at the cap works really well. On the white backdrop, it is there, but because of color contrast and the way how our eyes see it, we don't see it as much. Further also, let's take a look at the metal. The metal looks pretty nice. And metal is actually very easy to do. It's essentially, it's a nice reflective metallic shader and that's it. But to make chrome, polished steel, etc., look good, we need to have an environment. Uh, number one mistake a lot of beginners do is they make a surface metallic but then they forget that in reality, objects exist inside an environment. As you can see here, I put in an environment. So we have the backdrop that's being reflected and then the light sources, which then create these very interesting bands. And that is kind of like then this color information on the steel that gives us the feeling of, oh, sweet, this is steel. Talking about lights, also quite interesting. We can see there's something on top left and right, kind of like vertical lights. And then there are these thin strips too. So I will talk about why and how we position these lights and how they will help giving more information to the design because we're really sculpting the three-dimensional look actually with the position of lights. The lights should not be... Um, distracting, but <clears throat> we also need to have some sort of reflection on the body so the the object doesn't look uh, super boring. Very good. Okay, with all that covered, we will also look into a more advanced plastic material. Let's get going. So here we are in Blender. I have the render file opened. The download link to this file is inside the description. So please go ahead and download it. And you can see we have the coffee maker rotated. So we see it from kind of like the side, the handle faces us. And if you recall just a minute ago, I was talking about 
how to rotate the coffee maker. So we see the handle not directly from the side or from the front, but slightly angled. I don't have any camera here yet, so I don't know how this might look. And I would like to be able to rotate later this whole set easily all at once. I have everything inside this uh, collection here. And I can obviously select all the parts and then rotate. But what might actually be a little bit easier is when I create one parent and I rotate that parent. And later when I have to rotate the whole coffee maker to fine tune it, when we place the camera, I simply select the parent and then rotate. Okay, so to do that, I press A to select everything. And then with the shift key pressed and the left mouse button, I click the top. I simply select the top because it's the easiest object to find. And then go object, parent, and we link all the objects to the parent. So now when I click the parent and I press N for the transform um, panel, here now I can very easily rotate it. And you see, super easy. And when I click this, it doesn't say any rotation, which is true because the object actually doesn't have any rotation. It's a child. It just follows what the parent does there. And you see, this is actually super, super easy to do. So maybe from this view, we can go to something like 60. You see, I see the this part of the handle and the sides. Very good. Then we can set up our backdrop. I zoom out a little bit, rotate my view, go to the top view. Uh, one thing I would like to point out when I zoom in and zoom out, pay attention to how the grid changes. Also here now it says meter, centimeters, uh, millimeters, pretty cool, no? This is actually super handy in Blender that the grid automatically updates. I would like also here the unit systems to be just in centimeters. That works much easier. And since we're on the properties, let's uh, set this to white and then we set this to zero. So we create a white world, but we turn the light off. So essentially it will be black. Okay, very good. So um, the camera will be at the bottom looking that way. So let's add then the backdrop to make sure, just in case somebody moved that 3D cursor, uh, cursor to, so shift S cursor to the world origin. And then we go to add mesh plane. And it's actually really large. We can go to plane here and then say, what about 100? Okay, let me zoom out a little bit. It's a pretty big backdrop and this is fine. Okay. Then we can go into a three dimensional view, go to edit mode edge select, select an edge. And there are no different ways how you want to do this. I will, sh I will show it actually in two different ways. So to extrude, I use the shortcuts a lot. So E is for extrude. Here's the um, extrude command. So E and then it's freely moving around. And then I want to restrain this one going up and down. So I press the Z key. Then I can move this up and down. And you see upper left corner, it reads out 50 centimeters, 40 centimeters. So I type in 50 centimeters and enter. Pretty cool, no? Let me press X and delete everything. You could also do it this way. It's a different uh, method. So you turn on the move command, you press E, and then you press escape. And what happened is you see we have now the extrusion, but by pressing escape after I pressed E, it stays where it is. And then if I go to the this view, you see how I have the grid, I can turn on grid snapping and absolute grid snapping. So it snaps really to the grid. And when I drag this up and hold control, you see how it snaps to the grid. And this basically only works when we are in really orthographic views, when we are in perspective views, 
the oh interesting it does it does work to the it works oh yo oh yeah but <laughs> you see the grid is really large um we want this to snap to um the smaller grid elements so you see like perspective and other graphic has a different grid scale but also here when i go to the front you see it's actually very easy this way to work clean with dimensions or the grid if you want to to do that by uh, moving this around and i'm holding the control key all the time or we can also turn this on then you don't have to hold the control key but it's just a permanent snapping very good okay so this maybe looks good if we go to the top view um alt click so alt left click on this edge we can then maybe move this one grid left and alt click um and then hold the control key and move this to the right so i make this bigger very good when i leave the object mode now now you see how big the object is we would like to have a nice rounded corner we go to modifier and uh, yeah, this is maybe fine. 10 again. Um, let's go to wireframe. This kind of looks blur boring to me. This is circular. This is fine. Nothing wrong with it. It's just visually not attractive. So I go to profile and change the shape to 0.6. You see then this way I can flatten or I can extend the rounding. This actually is much nicer. It's a slower transition from a flat into the curved into the flat surface. Very good. Okay. We can adjust also the size of the, the rounding just via the modifier. That's actually the really nice part about these modifiers. I don't physically manipulate the or change the geometry because if I model something it's done and the modifiers can be turned on off we can even remove them anyway then the last step to do you see there are these facets with the object selected shade smooth mm, there we are cool okay so with the backdrop done we can now add the camera so we go add and camera the camera we can rotate zero 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 then we know along the x-axis let's rotate this up i don't know yet how much 90 percent uh, 90 degrees particularly here we would like to use a tilt shift we don't want the um, the coffee maker to perspectively foreshorten so to maybe now take a look at everything i will do the following i will uh, click and drag and uh, this one down or let's go the other way right click and then split horizontal you see you can when you go to these corners here there the cursor turns into a plus we can also then drag based on the direction i go um, slice the interface or i can always join them afterwards or just use the cursor to do it uh, sorry not the cursor the right mouse button menu okay so here in this view we will go into the camera then we can press n and actually even t minimize this so we really make everything nice and small uh, we can go to the dimensions not sure yet how big this image will be so but maybe 800 by uh, 1000 by 600 no mm, no opposite way so 600 by 1000 so you see how i'm changing the ratio very nice okay then can you go to a side view that's very easy not to see where we are and what we do maybe move this up a little bit so let's actually go to our reference and see uh we see not much from the top this is actually we can see the camera really looks at this level nearly parallel okay 
So when I move the camera further up and then with the camera selected, I do a tilt shift. You can see how I actually look more down while actually looking forward for this shot and the reference. Um, it looks we are more here. Okay, we can get a little bit closer. When I get closer, you can see how the button on top kind of like gets lost. So maybe we change this to a 90 lens, then what about 120? You can see how the perspective distortion is actually uh, being minimized. Uh, we can also see quite a lot on this, the bottom part and here the metal ring. So let's see, I'm hiding this. Yeah, um, maybe this degree is too strong, 100. So we can get a little bit closer. Very good. Yeah, there we are. Okay. And even here, if I would like to show a little bit more of this bottom part, slightly the camera a little bit up, not too much. And then we just tilt shift it back down. Alt H to show the glass again. And with S I can scale the icon of the camera. Very nice, the, um, the camera was put into this collection. So I will drag this one out to there and also here the plane I will drag out. And now it's up to us, do we want to create a collection for the scene information? I mean, we will have the camera and the backdrop and the lights. It's not really necessary, but I will keep my coffee maker inside this collection. And this I will call backdrop. And kind of like we are, we have set up everything of our um, environment. And now we can go ahead and add the lights and then do the materials. Now we can set up the lights. Before we do that, let's take a look at this reference image again. So we see on top, left and right, and in the back. And we see the lights also because the body is reflective. So we'll, we will first actually set up the materials to be somewhat reflective, very basic. So then when we place the lights, we can see how they work. Okay, so we can click this material here. I will switch this to shader editor. Mouse will zoom in a little bit and then very quickly adjust the values here. So you see these are all shared. Um, these are different materials you see this here. So you and you, this all should be, let's say plastic orange. Very nice. And again, so you know, this is all the same. So then I can go to here and say plastic orange, and I'm just replacing the material there. This should be steel. Very good. Easy. And we know this is metallic. Same with this band here. There's steel. And there we have some feet at the bottom. I can make this a little bit dark there like this. Very nice. So when I uh, zoom in, I see here there's another set. Um, and yeah, they all use the same material. Very good. Then we have the plastic. So let's maybe also make this nice and reflective. Very good. We can call this uh, plastic black. Then let's see if they all use the same. No, they do not. So also here, we swap all this out. Good. Yeah. So um, if we want, clean up the unused blocks. And you see a lot of the materials are gone. Where is this? Oh, there's one object in the inside. So select this object, H, there, this one. That uses that 
Alt Material and clean up there. Alt H, shell object. Very nice. Okay, save, never forget. Now we have the basic material set up. We can also go to the floor, give this uh, a material floor. This should first be white. So um, specularity down, very good. Now we can place the lights and we will start with the top one. Shift S, cursor to the world origin to make sure we are going to insert the light directly above. There is the light. In the camera here, I will zoom in a little bit and then um, maybe a little bit more. Was it Control B? Yeah, with Control B, you see I'm drawing this rectangle. And when I do a rendering, only inside, yeah, switch to cycles, only inside this rectangle is the rendering taking place. Okay, very good. The reason why we did this, so when we render only what we are interested in is being calculated, so we make the rendering actually run faster. Now I can move this light up. I will bring this light to here, nice and high, just on, on purpose. We switched the render engine to cycles, and there we are, pretty cool. Now when I move this one down, now we can see how the light is getting closer further away. Let's take a look at the material. We have to set this to be specular. There's now the reflection. So when we move the light really far away, you can see how small the reflection gets. Also how weaker the light and when we get closer, how bigger the reflection gets and how stronger the illumination. Now take a look at the reflection. You see it looks like a complete band around. If we take a look at this here, we can see actually the edges of the light body. So that tells us in the rendering I did before, this light is much smaller. Okay, so let's say 20 um, or 30. Now, because this is a smaller light surface, <laughs> you see it completely washes out, overburns the object. Why is this happening? So this whole area emits 10 watts of light, if we want to call it this way. But now uh, it's very focused, so it's really bright. If we make this two meters, it's 10 watts spread over this area. So it's weaker. So that's a very easy way to think about this. And to adjust this, well, we just have to adjust the light power, maybe one. Now when I zoom in a little bit, now there we can see how small this is. So maybe 20 centimeters is too small. What about 30? There it's getting a little bit bigger. What about I move this further up, further down? What about a little forwards or backwards? You see how I'm moving the light source actually. 40. And let's take a look at that reference again. Okay, it goes down a little bit. Um, 50. Yeah, it's getting it's getting bigger and maybe. So there are multiple ways now how we can achieve this and the size and the position and the watts. So it's not like one only final solution you have to punch in and you get it. Basically, I can move this further away, then I have to make it stronger and um, bigger because you can see how small this is. I can move this closer, then I might have to adjust the scale and make the light also weaker. Okay, anyway, let's keep it there for right now. And the light is actually added to this collection. That's not what I want, so let's drag this out. When I click the collections, you see when I add a light now, this will be added to the scene collection and not inside this brown collection. This area light, let's call this area top. So we know what it is. Let's add another light. So shift A or add light area. There you see now, there it is. 
and we call this one area left. Can move this one up, move this, uh, whoops, move this up, and then I move this one over. We need to rotate it. So here I press N, and this is, yeah, Y, so minus 90. Very good. Oh, look at that. All the light comes from the left side. And when I take a look at the object from here, from the side, I switch into wireframe mode so I can better see where the light is in relationship to the body. And let's look at the reflection. Also here on top, how high it gets. You see it stops actually down there. And in my rendering, it nearly falls over there. So this means this light is actually too high. When I move this one down, you see how the light reflection moves up and down. Okay. But now, now we can see this light is also really way too big. It's a square. Let's turn this into a rectangle. And I will center this first, maybe here, and then adjust the height and adjust the width. And you see by making this a nice strip, I get a really bright highlight. And making it wider, I get kind of like a wider reflection. I move this one up a little bit. Um, let's pay attention to at the bottom. Yeah, and then we have something there. Okay. Yeah, we're getting close. Okay, very good. Then I can go into a top view, Shift D and Escape. Then I move this one over. I'm trying to use the grid to space this out evenly or when this is uh, along the x-axis minus 40 then this should be 40 and the rotation this was actually minus 90 so this is then 90 so i'm rotating it that way okay the light strength is also really strong let's call this one right Towards, towards, okay, ah, much better, cool. Check out how this nicely is sculpting the body. So if body, I mean how it's illuminating the object when we start dimming this one light. And the other light sources are nice and strong. Okay. We don't really know yet what power we will use. So I simply set everything in this case here to one. So it's not overpowering everything. Okay. They are actually pretty much to the side. And you can see here, um, so they're wider and then there are also, there's a tiny gap there. Okay, so how can we get this? That's easy. When I move the slide towards the camera, you see oh, I'm rotating it actually around. Let's do the same here too. No? Um, another thing you noticed, if you pay attention to what's going on here, you see how the shape is changing. Um, well, think about the cam. Think about what's going on. So here is the bot. So the um, the coffee maker, and then it's seeing the light this way, and it's that's the reason why this is rotated. So if I rotate this light, so rotate, and then Z for the Z axis, and I'm making the light look perpendicular. Look at the body. Look at that. Can you see? Okay, so that means from a top view, I want to rotate the light. So it is actually the line is facing the um, the coffee maker. Cool. Okay. 
Here I'll bring this one back, ideally to a similar position to make this again really easy, minus 40 and 40, and then this along the y-axis is minus 12, then this is minus 12, 2, and then the rotation here. Okay, now they're pretty much equal. Um, no, there's still not enough of a gap, so I might be able to even move this further to here and then rotate it and go to here and rotate it. Okay, I'm still very loosely moving the lights around. Okay, so let's say for the moment what we're we doing, this is nearly good. Maybe we move the light sources G and Z down a little bit and when I hold the Alt key, this is important, and then I click and drag this, you see that actually it can affect two objects. If I only click and drag, it affects the active object. So this way I can select both and adjust the, um, the size X and maybe move them down a little bit more. They're slightly intersecting with the ground right now. This is okay. And very gentle, alt and then click and drag. Good. We need to have reflections here at these corners too. So I go to a top view, select this one, shift D, move this back, rotate it. And then I can see, okay, hmm, how can I set this one up? We call this maybe left back. Okay, and this is this light is only doing the function to shine a small strip onto it. Uh, so that means we let's switch this to local. Okay, so this is why we can make this really nice and thin. You see how by making a thin light, we get this type of a thin reflection. And I don't know where it needs to be. I can move this around and then pay attention to what's happening. If I move it actually behind the, um, the coffee maker, the light shines on the coffee maker based on how I rotated it. And I get a really beautiful rim right on the edge. If I move this a little bit further away and rotate it too, if I zoom in, there you can see there's a tiny gap. No? Strength, strength is too much, 0 0.5, 0 0.1. We need to soften this right now. Okay, let's take a look. Now oh, we're getting closer. The light is actually smaller in the back. So um, maybe make this 30, 32. Okay, very good. Then we can do the same quickly, shift D, move it to here and rotate it plus minus, and then I move this around till this looks maybe equal. Yeah, so um, that's actually, as you can see, not really very complicated. We call this one then right back and there are all our lights, very nice. You can select the, um, the backdrop and maybe turn roughness down, specularity up. Let me take a look how this feels. What about we make this a black one and a little bit of a roughness? Okay, yeah, now we can see how, how this works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So basic lights are set up. Now the question is, what do we do next? We can actually fine tune the materials and then fine tune the lights for the renderings. That kind of makes sense. We could also um, fine tune the lights and then do the materials. It doesn't necessarily matter much, but I think at this point, um, going in and adjusting the materials first makes a little bit more sense. 
because then when we adjust the lights, we can really focus on illuminating our materials and our product well. Never forget, control C, sorry, control S to save. Very good, so the materials. Let's actually, before we get going, go to color management and inside the render properties, go to filmic and set the look maybe to a medium high contrast. You see then the colors actually feel a little bit different or high contrast up to you there. Okay. Now, um, I can zoom in a little bit more. Um, and the it's up to us now how we do how do we want to work? Do we just want to zoom in into individual areas? That is fine. Um, we could also if you want, just so you understand how quickly it is to readjust the interface here. I'm joining these areas, uh, split vertical there, split horizontal, and then set this here to shader editor. Now actually here I can zoom in and have a much bigger rendering of my, my object. Here's then my 3D view and then here's my material view. That actually works much better. Okay, let's save. And let's take a look at our plastic reference. So we can see that the product color is quite, quite orange. And we select this object here, we go to base color, click on it. Oh, it's nice and big. Um, so we have saturation and here, what about in value, we change the value. So it's getting darker. You see it moves actually this slider. Saturation, then the strength of the color. Hue obviously moves the color around. Yeah, I'm going to compare. Okay. That doesn't look now so bad. Uh, seems maybe a little bit more, more to the red area maybe a little bit brighter. Okay, good. The plastic for the, um, the orange is pretty easy to do. Now we can work with the specularity to make sure how strong of a reflection do we actually want to have on it and how, how much do we want this to be blurry. Now, you do not want to set a plastic to zero roughness because the um, surface can't be perfect. There are bumps, small structures to it. Even with a car, a car looks super polished, but if you go closely and take a look at the car paint, you will see there is a little bit of bumpiness and such to it. So a tick of roughness, even if it's just a small notch, helps preventing these reflections of the lights to be razor sharp and crisp. That adds a nice tick of realism to it. And then with the specularity, this is now to, um, to judge how, um, how strong would we like this reflection to be. In the ref uh, reference here, we can see they're actually quite strong. Okay, so let me put them to here. Very good. Okay, nice. Let's take a look at the, the metal. Uh, the metal is actually pretty good. Also here, a little bit of a reflection really helps making this um, to look less computer generated. Very good. We have glass here. It has a, a base color and a tint. So how do we turn this into glass? We simply turn transmission on. And when we set alpha down or up, now we can see how actually this, this can work. If we set this to there, then it's transparent. So it's nice, nice and clean. 
Um, but is glass always really super transparent? Uh, or I mean, not having a color, sometimes it helps actually by adding a little bit of a color to it. I'm reversing the, the slides because I wanted to show you also a different way how to make a glass. You can go to add, then shader, and then you go use glass and drop this one in. And then here, this color I drag onto there and there we are. So this is actually the easiest way if you just want to have a very small glass shader. This one I keep here based on what is connected, the one is being used. Okay. You see how this is um, quite tinted and this is already the amount of um, color being used. So if I change the saturation, you can see how the glass gets pretty, uh, no, it's kind of grayish because set the value here to one. Now it's nice and clean. Otherwise it was kind of like smoky. And then we can figure out the, the tinting. Dragging this on the color wheel is very tricky to make fine adjustments, which why I think I really like the um, H, S and V sliders. With the color wheel, I can easily pick the color. So the hue, and then with the slider, I go back and adjust the strength. And you see here, even a very tiny value, 0 0.03 or four, adds a little bit of color. So you notice something there is happening. Okay, cool. Then let's uh, select the plastic. Here, things will get a, a little bit more interesting. So we would like to texture this and create a nice plastic material. Let's save. And to roughen up this surface, we can add a roughness to it. And that makes everything look like it's super satin polished, uh, sorry, not polished, sandblasted. With the color, I can darken this more, very good. Do I want this to be more reflective or less reflective? It's really up for us to decide. And if I zoom out now, you can see that we can create kind of like a nice structured plastic from a distance. But if we zoom in, then now we will see, well, this is too uniform. And I would like at this level now to see that there's a microscopic and less microscopic, so bigger scaled texture on it. So let's turn roughness off for the moment because the the roughness is basically a slider that artificially blurs the reflection to give us the illusion of a surface structure. But now we're going to put that surface structure actually in. So add and um, I will use then texture coordinates. We use this one to generate Think about like a three-dimensional scale for the material to flow over our 3D object. Then add and we go and use the noise texture. Object scale to vector. Uh, we can go factor to here. Very good. I will turn reflectivity off for the moment and then the scale 500 there, we see this now much better. Okay, now here's an interesting tip. I zoom in now and let's take a look at what the noise here all does. So we have scale, obviously that makes the size of this texture bigger or smaller. Then we have detail and roughness. If I set roughness to zero, you see how smooth this looks detail to zero or 10 uh, doesn't really show much, but the roughness is actually really interesting. Now with, it looks actually much more like a stone, but if I set this to zero, this looks more like blotches, which are kind of like very fluid. We also have 
the distortion. It's also quite fun to play with. Looks like oil color or interesting details. So I will set this to zero, detail to zero, the scale at 500. I, I will leave it at that right now. So you see uh, where it is. Okay. Uh, and again, why do we use actually this coordinate system? You see, this is a scale for, for the texture and it's kind of stretched here a little bit, but if I put the object in, let's let's say this way the software now better understands how to flow uniformly this 3d texture over this 3d body or oh, i said 3d texture it's more like a, a procedural mathematically calculated texture that needs to flow over the surface without being stretched okay uh, 2000 is this maybe a good detail we don't know yet maybe we'll keep it at this okay so now we figured out kind of like the scale I will set reflectivity back so I have a nice uh, reflection and now we put in our next building block so a bump mapping the factor goes into the height so for the height is kind of like up and down literally height uh, for simulating valleys and hills and then the normal goes into normal and then there now we can see how this bump effect creates ref like highlights and shadows and this looks like a three-dimensional surface point one to limit the strength point zero one to limit this even more now it looks kind of like wavy it's actually quite nice how um, how blotchy this looks. Now the next trick is actually quite interesting. I will change the bump to 0.1 on purpose to make this a little bit bigger. And what I would like to do is I would like to create islands of bumps. So think about it, you have a flat surface um, and then we we take a pen and draw dots over it. And where the dot is, we want kind of like a bump to pop up. So essentially, if we for one moment actually go back and take a look at this, there you can see we have a gradient from white to black, white to black, black to white. No? And I would like to adjust this gradient to be maybe more white and then a um, little bit black. So what's, what we're going to do is now a color transformation. Um, you have the same also in Photoshop. These are very common um, tasks or commands. So we go to add, convert, and here's something called color ramp. And color ramp looks like a gradient. You see how, how you can move this. For example, um, this idea of a gradient, how we use the levels in Photoshop, how to increase the blacks, how to increase the whites and compress the colors in between. So the factor goes into factor, color goes into color, and now pay attention to what happens when I move this one to here. You see, in general, it got much brighter. Actually, more white is covering the surface, and I have now these dots. And when I bring this over, you see the, the dots get darker because this is black, mid gray and white. But now I say black and dark grays are all black. And then there's a quick transition from black to white and then medium gray to white. That's all white. Cool. Okay. So this is actually what I would like to use for here and look at that and you see how oh, we now have a much bigger flat reflection and then there are actually these these bumps now the the tricky thing is to figure out okay are they actually pushed in or 
do they actually come out? There's a very easy way we could flip the, um, um, the position of these points, but essentially we want to invert it. Is there an, an invert function somewhere? Color, yeah, invert. And then we drag this one to here. So now we have a slider, version A, version B. And this actually looks more, the bumps are pushed in, and this looks more the bumps are coming out of the surface. And maybe here's strength 0.5, you can make this stronger. Okay, when I zoom in more, let me try to see where can where can I find a good example. Yeah, maybe here. So there and there. So pay attention to what's happening here. You see this is kind of flat. I'm actually creating a plateau. Think about it, there's a hill and now I'm taking a planer and I'm shaving all the hills to be at the same height. So this is the valley, then comes the, the slope, and then these are the plateaus. Maybe actually from this view, this looks easier. You see this is nice and round, and then there it's flatter. Yeah, and that's actually how you can create this very typical plastic look you see on a lot of products. Take a, um, a camera and take a photo, and then you will see actually that's not just, um, how can I say that, a lot of um, round bumps, but they're actually more flat. Now with the position of these two sliders, I can specify more how big are the valleys, how big are the plateaus, so the space between them. And then ultimately with the slide, with the value for scale here, I can adjust now the size of the bump. Now you see it's actually it's pretty pretty good. Uh, strength can make it a little bit weaker. Wow, look at that. Doesn't that look amazing? Yeah. Of course, when we zoom in, we can still see this is computer generated. But if we take a look from the outside, now we can see, hey, this reflection is kind of blurry and there's a structure to it. But we still want to add a little bit of roughness to it. So it's a tick uh, better. And then when we zoom really out, then yeah, there we have it. So this is a really easy way uh, to create a nice structured plastic material. And then it's a matter of fine tuning the rest of the values. Again, here, it really comes in very handy when you have actual physical materials you could photograph and study inside a room, outside in different light conditions. For example, if I take a look at my renderings here, you see there's a reflection on it, but it's more more subtle on the, the black plastic. So here you see how I slowed this down a little bit, not slowed it on, tuned it down a little bit. With the roughness, if I increase this, I can create a bigger satin effect or if I set this to zero, I remove this. If I set this to zero, then it's nice and clear. 0.1, you see how I'm kind of like playing with my values here now. Okay, very good. Yeah, maybe is the black kind of good? Yeah. You see, this is also not real black. We don't have that material, maybe a little bit brighter artificially. Very good. But this actually, I would say now, is a pretty, pretty decent plastic material. Particularly in close ups, this looks really nice and sophisticated. Very good. And safe. So now we can take a look at how can we create this colored. Um, backdrop since with the last material we did a lot in the notes we can do the same here too it's actually quite fun and again this is a very good demonstration why a lot of these things I really don't do in Photoshop I just 
make my renderings look the way how I want to write in the render program instead of jumping between programs. So here is my, my backdrop. And I will do the following. I will go into edit mode. I will go to wireframe mode. So you see what I select, press A, and then I will say unwrap in the UV editor. So with this unwrapping, when I go to UV editor, you see here is my unwrapped geometry. About the unwrapping, think about it. Maybe um, you, you have a cardboard box and then we unfold it. That's kind of like what we did. Okay, good. Then we can leave the edit mode, go into object mode. No, we go here to the floor and then I will do the following. I've actually stopped the rendering here and I will start the rendering here. There we are. Then let's go add. And I would like to have a gradient. Okay, so is there a gradient color texture? Gradient texture, okay. So there it is. Okay, how does this look when I plug this in? Maybe here, uh, let's set the environment light to 0.5. So we see something, ah, there's a gradient, linear, this one, diagonal, spherical, okay, radial. Hmm, but it's black and white. How can I overwrite this? So I would like to mix between two different colors actually. So the gradient is kind of like a black to white gradient. And I can use that to mix between two colors. So think about this as a mask or a path. Add color. Is there something where we can mix between two colors? And there it is, mix RGB. I make this red so you see what's going on. Then this goes into the factor because this gradient is becoming, this black and white gradient is becoming the factor that blends between these two colors. And then when I swap out these colors, I can create, well, as you can see, gradients. But now how can I control actually the orientation of this gradient? And this is where, actually I will do this quickly here, the UV mapping comes in very handy. Go into edit mode, there's my UV map, press A, and when I rotate this one and say 90, nothing happens. Hmm. Why? Well, you see this vector has no input. So when I go to input and texture coordinate and say, hey, use the UV coordinate system, there we are. So when I rotate this around, you can see how the gradient yeah, moves around. The minus 90, this is what we had before. The gradient goes left to right, uh, but I want to go up and down. So I need to rotate this correctly. So you see like black to white, red to white, and I don't know, my mouse is actually flipping a little bit. So when I rotate it this way, I type in 90 and enter. I pressed R for the rotate. You see how from the right black to the, no, the left black to the right white over the mesh, this blends now, and then it's using this gradient to mix between these two colors. I center this a little bit because this is also important where this mesh is because this is kind of like the gradient. And now I say from the left to the right of this gradient, perfectly position my mesh on it. If I move this one down, now this rectangle rather only gets the last of the gradient. Because again, this is black to white or with this mix, this is red to white. Got it? Okay. So somewhat closely centered, doesn't have to be super perfect. There we are.
Okay, and then this UV unwrapping, now this is basically what does the trick for us. It copies this unwrapping as a 2D coordinate system. Okay, so now how, how can I bring actually this color further down? I'm not doing this in here while I could. I could actually uh, G and X and move this around. By the way, if I want to, that's one way. Again, this is kind of like the midpoint of um, the mix between red and white, but we do this more in here. And we use this color ramp again. So again, we have a gradient. And then I say, well, more black at the beginning, which means more red is the result. And I can bring this back and then just play around. You see how this helps. So let me explain again one more time what's happening here. So we have a gradient, black to white flows over it. Then we clamp the values and say, at the beginning, just have black, 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 and then it switches to black to gray and white, and then white, white, white. So this translated over here is it starts black, 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 then, then comes the change to white, and then it's only white. If I only want to have a little bit of white at the end, well, and this goes to there and this goes to there. And you see, so it's a very simple logic. And with this, it's much nicer to change the, the blend. I can also make a nice and sharp blend, which is why I don't mess with here. I mess with this color ramp. Cool. So there we have this really interesting color. Maybe something like this here. Now we can switch back to the viewpoint turn off the rendering, um, let's exit uh, UV, the editor, go into rendering, and then we can play with the value and the hue, and for example, theme this a little bit more. If I make this too bright, well, I can make this bright. It looks like, it reminds me of Hawaii, I don't know why. Um, but this is the render result is more actually pretty desaturated, so less saturation. Yeah. And then we also can see, whoa, the orange needs more red. And a little bit more red. That's maybe too much. And maybe there, tick more. Okay, yeah. To make then the backdrop nice and reflective, flop, reflectivity on, and there we have it on there. Okay, so we are reaching kind of like now the stage where we can fine tune our scene setup and then create our renderings. I might want to you now revisit my lights a little bit. Let's take a look at the reference. So that's kind of like where they are. Okay. Also, this down here looks actually really nice. Good. Let's see what I have here. Pretty much can see this everywhere too. When I place the light a little bit closer, this is going to change the reflection a little bit. I was paying attention to what's happening down here in terms of size, but the way where I have them is actually pretty good. Maybe the strength of the reflection, I increase a little bit, very good. And then let's say this plastic material is done. Now I can go ahead and think about the lights. This looks very um, uniform, the, um, the light, strength in general are the same. So let's maybe give this one two watts. So it pops better, three watts. Okay. You notice the orange plastic starts to change the color. It's being overexposed. So mm, there, 
0.2. If I want the reflection to be much brighter, I just have to then increase the reflection really um, here instead of just increasing the light. Uh, so it's just one thing to really keep in mind. If we set this to be a weak reflection, it will only show a weak reflection. If I then want to have a stronger reflection, I have to change that reflection or the specularity instead of just artificially blowing up the lights. These rim lights can actually be quite nice. So 0.5, definitely way too strong. They're distracting, they're really burning. 0.15, yeah, okay. This one here, uh, we make 1.5, so it's a little bit weaker than the left light. Three, yeah, 2.5. And what do we have here? Also 0.2, okay, very good. And then we have the one on top, two, okay, yeah, good, so. Let's say the lights are kind of like fine-tuned and we will set everything back here to zero and we now are ready to do our renderings. I would like, since it is in chronological order, do the white rendering first. Okay, good. So here's my backdrop and I just would like to have a basic white backdrop. There's a floor material, very good. And I will do the following. Let's go to add and shader, and I will use diffuse there and drop this one in uh, and set this to white. So what this basically did is it removed this material definition and currently just uses this material definition or shader. So just a diffuse is a very is a basic flat material. Okay, I can if I want to. Um, let's see what happens when I increase this to one. It adds a lot more light. Now this is not very good, but point one to brighten everything up a little bit. It's also interesting for what's happening with the metal. Zero and. Point one, you see here in the black, it gets bright when I zoom in because this is the, the color of the environment. So point zero 0.05 makes it less pitch black. So computer black, but more a room black. That's okay, good. Um, here, what do we have there? Okay, so this reflection on this part looks a little bit funny. Um, but if we zoom in here, we can see, I can see the, the plastic part. So the material is fine. Unfortunately, this ring reflects a lot of this ground plane, which makes this not look so interesting. Let's take a look here. Look at that. How do we get this effect back? Okay, let's go back to here. Edit mode, uh, edge select, select this edge and maybe bring this back. Oh, what's happening? You see there, we're bringing this back a little bit. So here basically the coffee maker starts reflecting the environment and we can try and see so if I select or shift all these four corners uh, left and right by the way I switch between the views when I press the Z key I get the um, the pie menu and I can click onto what mode I want I can press s and x and scale along the x-axis and then pay attention to what happens actually to my metal part and maybe no, this is getting too, mm, this is too, too crazy. So the width is maybe good. And here, 
maybe a little bit there. So I see something is, is happening. Okay, very good. Let's leave edit mode. Shift, um, middle mouse button, zoom this down. We can scroll in a little bit. Another nice trick, I would like this to be perfectly cut out uh, or brighter, Shift A. This is kind of like not necessarily a good way to do it, but this is the nice thing about computer graphics. We can trick around. Shift A and add an emission, so a light material, and we turn that whole thing maybe into a light. So you see when we set this to zero, it's pitch black or with um, 0.1, it's kind of gray, 10. Well, it's a light surface now. Nah? <laughs> It emits a lot of light, but you you see um, this is now kind of like actually white. Um, it blocks everything out, but because it's emitting light, it does actually also reflect on on the surface. Okay. This artificially also was improved to go to to this level. Okay. Very good. So here's actually now the rendering of the white environment. How we later are going to cut this perfectly out, I will show. But for the moment, this is kind of where we are. Because even in real life, um, this would not be a computer graphics white. Even if, 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 even if it is a white backdrop, there is a little bit of, yeah, how could I say that? Um, color to it, white isn't white. And I could, in this case only, if I want, maybe add a little bit of here and and maybe 0.5 and see how I brighten this up. But you see the problem is now I'm, I'm brightening up the whole design. Also actually these reflections are becoming terrible. Here's now an interesting counter trick. This are lights to emit light and for the reflections to have something better i can add reflection boards so shift a plane um rx and 90 enter i move this one back maybe to behind the camera okay and then this object i make so you see what's going on i make this red there you can see this in the reflection and when I make this one pitch black, there, I have this back, you see? So this is a very simple trick to have my environment, my lights, and then where I want something dark in a reflection, I simply add behind the camera a reflection board. What about when I go into top view, shift D, and I move one here to the side? Bring this closer. I'm paying attention to what's happening here. So I need to be really close to even show up. Mm. So it's not really adding anything necessarily. Oh, actually it does right here. Alt H. Okay, cool. So maybe I can very loosely position them, uh, clean up the rotation, and then Shift D, bring one over maybe to the other side. And then here, these three, I I put into a collection, and maybe I call this um, black box or black reflectors. And then this I put in there. Let's turn all this on so I can turn them on and off or also for the rendering completely ignore that they're not being rendered. Yeah, very good. So I think this looks actually really nice. Now, because we spent a lot of time on creating this material, when we go to rendering, turn this on and also hear the denoising, let's save. First, set this to 32 and viewport denoise. Let's see what happens when this reaches actually 32. 
we need to make sure that the denoising doesn't filter out the details. Okay, so this is good. When I zoom out a little bit, how does this look from here? Just a moment and yeah, there you can see it filters out a lot of the, the noise. The glass here, et cetera, looks really good. So the problem is the denoising from that from that distance is too much. The reason why I point this out is this rendering now, when we do a final rendering, will take a little bit longer. I'm not going to record this for the whole time. Um, but I will need to figure out now what level of value that will be. And then in the end, I will kind of like give you a tip on how to set up these uh, values. But as you can see for where we are right now, this is actually pretty cool. I set this, you saw for the viewport already to 10. Maybe even here we can set this to 10. So when we do a quick rendering, that looks nice and clean. Now I know that the, the plastic is gone. We will fix that later. But overall, the product looks good. Say to create now the black version uh, for the backdrop and the environment, quite easy. We turn this off so it doesn't show up in the rendering. Then we will change the light here to zero. And we will select the backdrop. And then we go add uh, shader and principled BSDF. That's another building block. And this I drag in here, set this to artificially black. And then I have my roughness, my specularity. And then with this, I can play with, well, how, how much of a reflection do I want? How rough should the reflection be? Yeah, no, it doesn't look too, too bad. Maybe a tick too strong in terms of reflection. There we are. Okay, very nice. And um, in case you had eagle eyes, let's turn this one off. What's going on here in the background? That is actually um, our light here. So we, we can try to move this around. Uh, move this one up. But you see, yeah, huh. it always shows up there. There are ways to not show this up in reflections, but then it wouldn't show up here either. So yeah, what do we do here? Two options. And this is unfortunately now a limit of, well, math. Um, this surface is reflective, so it shows the light also because based on where the, the camera is no. We we can hide this by maybe making the material more more reflective, and hopefully somebody will not notice that behind there it's a little bit shimmery because I draw the attention more to here. Maybe that could work. And actually, if I zoom in, you can see it's gone pretty well. By the way, look at this beautiful highlight, particularly here on this rim because of this light. Well, there you can really see how much this adds to it. Beautiful. Um, the other option, let me actually turn this off, is, well, maybe we need to change the, the backdrop. So when, when we make this Bigger, look at that. It's, it's actually gone. Yeah, this is really good. So that's fantastic. Yeah, that's it. I could, I was thinking maybe I need to change also the position here. There you can see how it shows all the, all the other lights. Looks like disco. Uh, there we are. And this really did the, did the job. Then leave edit mode lower 
Ah, interesting. It cut, it's still a little bit there, but not as strong. Cool. Zip. Maybe the camera I move back a little bit. I would like to see more also of this ground here. Very gentle reflection. Yeah, very nice. So can actually move this maybe down a little bit more, a little bit further to here to bring this down. Cool. Okay. Now if we zoom in, that's a that's a pretty respectable rendering, particularly in this environment with the black uh, backdrop. The handle looks really nice. Because it's all black, it's maybe maybe a little bit too black. So I really need to work with white reflections to make elements pop back. When I change, for example, this more to a, a dark gray, there you can see how the handle becomes a little bit more, more visible. But then also this gets actually brighter. Uh, but this is also a pretty nice rendering. Yeah, but I wanted this to be nice and pitch black. Okay. Yeah, and then for the colored backdrop, we can bring this back in. And because we adjust already the, the backdrop, there's something really we need to change here. Yeah, okay. Very good. So you see, quite easy. Um, via various simple settings and swapping out materials to create three very different renderings. Obviously, we could also then make work even more complicated by making for each um, rendering a different lighting setup if we want to. But where it is right now, we can simply keep it. So we can create renderings now. And this topic is a little bit tricky to do right now because I have to address or point out also that Blender is currently making a switch from version 2.9 to version 3. The software does not change radically, but even for the render engine, which by the way is faster in the new version, also the denoising works a tiny bit different. But since version 3 isn't out yet, I decided to go with version 2.9, which is accessible to everybody. And now to do the rendering and do it well, let's actually first take a look at this image. You can see there's a little bit of yeah, blurriness on this plastic. I shot this from a distance. And take a look at how big this image is and how many pixels we have to capture the plastic. When I zoom in, the area of this plastic body gets bigger, so more pixels can be used to describe the pattern. When I get closer, or even closer, there you can see the pattern even more. So what I would like to point out here is we see a structure plus the blurriness. Here we kind of just see the blurriness. No? Something to keep really in mind. Also, this is how big this image is. If the image is smaller, the effect will be even less noticeable. If the image would be much bigger, so more pixels, the software could produce more of the result. So that means now applied to Blender. So this is the way how we would set everything up. We go to Output. And here now we can specify how big do I want this object to be? We can see the handle is kind of small. So maybe 200%. So when I do a rendering, there you can see how big this image actually is. If I go to view and one-to-one, -one, this is now one-to-one. -one. Okay, renders decently fast. If we zoom in a little bit, we can see some of the noise detail, but uh, not the noise, the bump mapping detail, but we can also notice there's noise happening, particularly here behind the glass and here on the handle. So not very attractive. Press escape. So what we can do to fix this? Well, we go to rendering and under sampling, 
Uh, it says 128 samples. So that's how many times it can refine it. If we set this to 600 and then render, you will notice actually that it's slower, logically. But it will also actually, when I zoom in now, in a moment, here you can see when these tiles are done, the noise is actually not as strong anymore. And the details of the plastic, for example, look cleaner because the graininess is more limited. So let's pay attention to here till this is done. There, now this is done. Okay, but it's still a tiny bit noisy when we zoom in. When we take a look at this image from a normal distance, oh, where is it? Come on, zoom. Uh, zoom all, there we are. And there, okay. Now we can't really see that noise on it. So maybe this is actually not too bad. So just by increasing the amount here. So the image will remain to render for another seven minutes on this Mac mini I have. We can turn on adaptive sampling that will sample everything a little bit faster. Now, if we really need to want to show the plastic structure, or let's say we don't really want to show the plastic structure, but we make nice and beautiful renderings fast. And when we zoom in, then we can show the detail. We can do the following. We go down, turn this on. Also this, for example, we can turn on. Open image, denoise is what we want. Look at the viewport. Flop, clean. But when I zoom in, you see actually this got cleaned up and I see my plastic. If I zoom out, it cleaned up and I see my plastic detail. I zoom further out. Well, now the plastic detail is gone because at this scale, the software thinks the plastic detail is actually more a noise pattern. No? But the rest is actually really nice and clean. Also here, this is pretty cool how this is removed. So we can set this maybe to 100. Let's be brutally small. And for final rendering, I have to go to render layers and simply turn this on, keep this where it is, and then we hit render. And there you see now how fast actually this image is being rendered. Then the whole image now is going to take one minute and not eight minutes something. And while we lose a little bit of the plastic detail from this distance, the rest of the rendering, however, looks actually pretty slick and nicely cleaned up. So it's kind of like a compromise we have to strike here. But the, the detailness we can show when we zoom in more. From a distance, we can also see that the reflection is nice and blurry on the plastic. So it's all nice and good. Now it's nearly, nearly done. Also here in the back, in a moment it will actually, no, there it starts cleaning the noise up. It looks fantastic. It looks pretty good. And then even on um, such a weak computer like the M1 Mac Mini I have, not that it's a weak computer, but I mean, it's just entry level. A rendering of this product just, yeah, takes a minute and 20 seconds. That's not really much compared to how much I'd, I spent when years ago we did renderings. And this looks pretty good. Perfect. Okay. Because this is also a bigger image, um, now we, we have more pixel size. If we want to put something into PDF or presentation, we always want to have like a higher amount of pixels. 
I showed you how to do this. If we would make this actually more to uh, um, an image that fits onto the screen, and then the level of, not, not the level, the amount of pixels we need could even be lower. So if I set this to 100, slot two, and then I render this here, that uh, whole image is going to take maybe 20 seconds. So reduces it significantly. Okay, very good. Then this is everything for this video. To now make the renderings for the other three images, all we need to do is just change the settings, the way how I shot them before. And then after each rendering, when it's done, we just go and say save as and save the image. And that's it.